today we're going to be addressing part of the New Zealand 1990 Bill of Rights. Now, also at that time, we have the 1689, 1689 um, English Bill of Rights, and that puts many, many restrictions on the New Zealand government, the English government, any of the countries that have this 1688-89 English Bill of Rights are very restricted in what their governments can do. But New Zealand came up with this 1990 Bill of No Rights. But I'm just going to try and show you. Okay, let me see if I can uh, kind of get through this. I don't know how to go to full screen. But anyway. Um, oh, no, I'll pull it back. Oh, no, no, I'll pull it back. Okay. So, okay, I'm a bit stressed. The 1990 Bill of Rights. Uh, okay, several people, Sue Gray, and then I just have noticed that Brian Tamaki, who I thought might be someone that we could all follow, they have been having these dubious arrests over protests that they've been having, and suddenly, that they've got all these lawyers that are taking dozens and dozens and dozens of cases to the New Zealand courts using the 1990 Bill of Rights. Now, the 1689 Bill of Rights still stands, but the 1990 Bill of Rights, in order for it to become completely and absolutely um, infused into a country, it has to be seen to be used through the courts. And what I'm noticing is that uh, Sue Gray is filing cases and she's getting them right through to the highest court. And what I'm thinking is that they are designing it that they lose in the first court and then they will win in the highest court. Now, I'm going to show you how this 1990 Bill of Rights is tied to the United Nations. And I'm thinking that one of these cases is going to lose in the high court and then I'm thinking it's going to be taken to the United Nations Court. And that's how they're going to infuse New Zealand and bind New Zealand to the United Nations laws of which they have no control over. So I, I've got a feeling that this is what they're all up to and why they're all having these, these strange arrests where they shouldn't be arrested and suddenly they're going to the New Zealand courts with their 1990 Bill of No Rights. I'm not going to talk about the Bill of Rights today because I'm not, this article is not about the Bill of Rights and what rights you've got and what rights you've not got. What it's just going to be showing you is how you are tied to thousands of laws outside of New Zealand, all because of one tiny little law in this 1990 Bill of Rights. So let's so, New Zealand, Australia, England, Canada, and even America were all originally, we all originally came from the 1689 Bill of Rights. Now, the 1689 Bill of Rights has only 15 articles, 15 key rights that you are entitled to. And what's happened is in New Zealand in 1990, they came up with the New Zealand Bill of Rights and it's got 29 articles. Now, don't think that you're safe if you're in Australia. Australia came up with theirs in 2017 and Australia has got almost exactly these things written into their rights as well. And as far as I was trying to look at the English Bill of Rights, and when you go to the page, it shows you a picture of the 1689 Bill of Rights, but then it shows that it's it's added on to that several pages. So I'm picking that England's got a new Bill of Rights too. Now, these new Bills, bills of Rights, that you don't realise it when you're reading them, that they give you your rights. So the New Zealand Bill of Rights has got 29 articles with all of your rights, and you think, oh, now I've got 29 rights instead of having 15. But what you've got to look out for is these pieces here that they add to it. This is called the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And what they've done is if they've infused United Nations laws 
into our domestic laws and they bound us to thousands of laws that we have no idea and we have no control over. Um, so this one says it to affirm New Zealand's commitment to the international covenant of civil rights. Now, what we've got in New Zealand is that um, many lawyers and many protesters are being arrested for silly reasons and they're sending this New Zealand Bill of Rights into the courts. Well, when it goes into the courts, it's losing in the lower courts and it's going right through. To, uh, Sue Gray's got one going through to the high court now. And what I'm thinking is that all of these rights, in order for it to become a, a constituted jo document, it needs to be put through the court by the people and it needs to have an outcome for them. Now, what I'm thinking they're going to do is it's going to go through to the High Court and I'm thinking it's going to lose. And then I'm thinking it's going to be sent to the United Nations. Once it's sent to the United Nations and it's won in the United Nations, that then constitutes the law not only into the United Nations that has no legal power, but it also constitutes it into our country. Now, so the first, this New Zealand Bill of Rights, the first one that I'm going to show you is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which you don't see what those articles are in the actual act of the New Zealand Act. So let's go and have a look. So the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights has another 53 articles. So whenever you're looking at these, this New Zealand Bill of Rights, you're not looking at 29 articles. You're looking at another 53 articles that come from the political rights of the United Nations. Now, this was organised in 1966 by both an Australian and a New Zealander. I'm not going to go into their names, but for all these years, since 1966, this covenant on civil and political rights has sat dormant, just quietly. And then when nobody was looking, it came into force in 1976. Now, in 1986, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and maybe even England, because our constitution came from England, all of our constitutions were removed. And New Zealand, New Zealand and England and Israel, suspiciously, have no constitutions. We are the only three countries in the world that have got no constitutions. So in nine, our constitutions were removed in 1986. Um, so this says here, the present covenant shall enter into force three months after the date of the deposit with the Secretary General and the United Nations of 35th Instrument of Ratification or Instrument of Accession. Now, if we're looking at our 1689 Bill of Rights, now, the bill, who is the bill? The bill is to the Majesty. The, the bill goes to the Majesty and the bill says, if you, if, if, if you want to run the government, you want to be in the monarch and you want to have a government, then this is the bill of our rights, our 15 rights that you have to uphold. And if you don't uphold this bill, then you'll all be removed from power. And the Majesty gets her accession. She accedes to the throne as the instrument of God to uphold the people's rights. But this is the instrument of the United Nations and it is their accession to the control of our rights. And this is not a bill, so nobody's accountable, but I'm gonna tell you who's accountable in a later edition. And so um, after a country ratifies these rights and says, yes, we agree with these rights, uh, three months after that, it goes into law, but it is a non-binding law. 
However, when they slip it sneakily into our Bill of Rights and then they slip it sneakily through the courts over other, over other um, complaints, it is then constituted into your domestic law. So we've got 53, now we've got 29 articles of the New Zealand Bill of Rights and 53 articles of the civil and political rights. Under the civil and political rights, what they believe is that um, the individual, all of us, have the, have the duty as a community of which we belong to be responsible to strive for the promotion and observance of the rights recognised in the present covenant. So the 53 rights that are in the present covenants, you're expected to uphold those rights, okay? So you have to go and read what they are. And these rights, by the way, are not rights like the, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. These rights do not apply for you as a country. They apply to the entire world. And what they're trying to say is that not only are you responsible as a community to take care of the less fortunate people in your own community, what they're now saying is that the Anglo countries need to also be responsible for the rights of all of the other countries that don't uphold those rights. And it's going to get scarier as we go along. 